Two ex-cons, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris, were taken into custody shortly after the attempted kidnapping of a young woman in Manhattan Beach, California. Their arrests marked the beginning of a horrific descent into the darkest regions of human depravity. As one of the most sadistic killing sprees in California history came to light, investigators found themselves face to face with evil personified. I'm Brian Dennehy, and this is Arrest and Trial. Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris were transported to the Los Angeles County Jail and charged with assault. Within days, Norris asked to meet with authorities. I'm Sergeant Curran from the uh, Sheriff's Homicide Bureau, and this is my partner, Detective Jansen. Uh, we're here today because we understand that you, Roy Norris, want to talk to us. Is that correct? Los Angeles County Sheriff's Detectives Dennis Curran and Jerry Jensen conducted the interview with Norris. Deputy District Attorney Stephen Kay monitored the conversation from an adjoining room. I have to tell you that even having been on a, a number of brutal cases, including the Tate LaBianca murders, I don't think I was really prepared to hear and what Norris well, told us that day because it was very brutal. Norris told us that he and Lawrence Bittaker participated in murdering five uh, teenage girls. Norris was pretty clear in what he was talking about. I mean, the thing that struck me most was how clear, how sharp his memory was, how evil these crimes were. Okay, uh, Norris began to talk about his close friend and perfect partner in crime, Lawrence Bittaker, who he had met while serving time at the California Men's Colony at San Luis Obispo. Pacific Coast Highway. And yeah, just wasting time. Bittaker and Norris would fantasize that when they got out that they wanted to come down to the South Bay uh, area of Los Angeles County and uh, kidnap teenage girls, uh, rape and torture them. After their parole, the two set out to turn their degenerate fantasies into reality. According to Norris, their first victim was snatched from the streets of Torrance, California. Any lift? What they did is they pulled up the street around the corner and then they opened the van and when she walked by they grabbed her and drug her in the van. They drove her up to the uh, San Gabriel Mountains and each one of them raped her multiple times. She realized that she was in serious trouble with these two human monsters and she asked them if she could pray uh, before uh, they uh, killed her. And Nora said, well, no, we're not going to kill you. They're going to kill me. <laughs> Let me pray first. <laughs> so we get out of the van, and all right away, Larry says how he wants to kill her. Norris and Bittaker ended up outside the van having an argument for about an hour about whether or not they were going to kill her, because Norris didn't think that uh, that was really going to be part of the plan. For kidnapping and rape. Larry, Larry, Larry. Give us some money. And no, money. Baker said, no, I'm serious. I, uh, there are not going to be any witnesses uh, left. And uh, so Norris finally agreed with him. And uh, Bittaker uh, section and part of a wire coat hanger that he had, gave it to Norris, uh, told Norris uh, uh, to strangle her with it. And they wouldn't even let her pray. Norris claimed they then dumped the girl's dead body over a steep ravine. The killing orgy had begun. Norris was a hard person to figure out. Uh, he didn't show uh, much emotion. Most of his uh, uh, statements and when he would describe what they did with the girls, you could almost see the gleam in his eye. According to Norris, he and Bittaker decided that kidnapping girls in broad daylight was far too risky, so they switched to hitchhikers. Two weeks after the first murder, they picked up their next victim. Hey. Come on, hop in. Okay. Right on. Their mode, once they got the gals in the van, was to drive to the mountains, hit control of them through hitting them, uh, tape them up, and then they'd drive to the mountains where they'd uh, uh, rape and, and torture. There are others. Norris told detectives that two months later, they spotted two young teens at a bus stop. 
After a brief conversation, the girls climbed into the van. It's better than the boss, hop in. It was a fatal mistake. Victims three and four were kidnapped over Labor Day weekend, and they kept them three days before they ultimately killed them after they took turns raping and torturing them. But Rui Norris still wasn't finished. There was one last victim. Well, the last one they killed uh, again by taking a coat hanger and wrapping around her neck and, and uh, twisting it. Roy Norris's story was gut-wrenching, but was it true? Could two serial killers really have murdered five women in a span of four months and completely escaped detection? There was only one other person who could answer that question, Lawrence Bittaker. We decided that we needed more evidence to involve Bittaker rather than just Norris's testimony. Did you reckon we played a small portion of the tape where he could obviously recognize it was Norris's voice on the tape? Bittaker claimed that no, that wasn't Norris, but you could tell from the look on his face and the whole world had just come crashing down on him and that his best friend had given him up. Yeah, I got nothing more to see you guys. Okay, take him out here. Here was a guy with 138 IQ. He could read a, a 400 page book in an hour and with a photographic memory. Uh, one time when he was in federal prison, they had given him the uh, test to be a prison guard just to see how he would do on it. And he finished the highest in the history of the federal system uh, on it. And from our investigation, we could tell that Bittaker was really the ringleader. Without Bittaker's corroboration, Roy Norris's statement could be seen as little more than the wild rantings of a sociopathic rapist. But detectives believed that Norris was telling the truth. There was only one problem. Without any bodies, the victims could never be identified. And with no victims, there was no crime. In most homicide cases, a confession marks the end of an investigation. But when Roy Norris admitted to killing five young women with ex-con Lawrence Bittaker, Los Angeles County Sheriff's detectives were faced with a dilemma. With no known victims, there was no way to prove that any of the crimes had even been committed. Normally, a homicide investigator gets called out to a scene. He's got a body that uh, will tell a story. We had no bodies. Uh, all we had was the fact that these guys claimed that they had killed these young girls. So we had to start backwards. We had to find where people were missing. Norris gave locations, dates, and uh, first names of our victims. And, and so we used that information and contacted the, the different cities and used their missing persons people to identify uh, our victims. Detectives connected the first victim to a missing persons report for 16-year-old Lucinda Cindy Schaefer. Cindy had disappeared on June 24th while returning home from a church function. According to Norris, the second victim was abducted on July 8th. Her first name was Joy. Detectives learned that 18-year-old Andrea Joy Hall was reported missing that same day. On September 2nd, 15-year-old Jackie Gilliam and 13-year-old Jacqueline Lamp never returned home from a trip to the beach. Detectives believed they became victims three and four. Detectives identified the fifth victim as 16-year-old Shirley Lynette Ledford, who disappeared on Halloween. Ledford's disfigured corpse was found dumped in a residential neighborhood a day after her disappearance. Unlike the other victims, police had a body they could link with the crime. But to successfully prosecute the case, the authorities would need to find the bodies of the other four girls. To do that, they would need the full cooperation of Roy Norris. Roy Norris's public defender offered Stephen Kay a deal. Norris would plead guilty to all five murders if he did not get the death penalty. In exchange, he would testify against Bittaker and help locate the victim's bodies. led authorities deep into the San Gabriel Mountains. After driving down several remote fire roads, Norris asked detectives to stop the car. Okay. 
Yeah, this looks like the place. He walked over to a steep ravine and pointed down the hillside. There's this bit here, and I went down this 300-foot cliff, and then we had to low crawl on our, our bellies under the, uh, the underbrush and went for about 150 yards, and we found what turned out to be Jackie Gilliam's skull, and we found uh, part of Leah Lamp's skull. And finding their, uh, their remains confirmed uh, what Norris uh, had told us. Uh, it was just very sad. There was a lot of anger. I'm sure that had Bideker been there, uh, we probably would have had to uh, pull people off. If authorities had any doubts about Norris's story, they were soon erased by several audio cassette tapes recovered from Lawrence Bideker's van. Because of the number of tapes, Lieutenant Curran asked a Los Angeles police officer to listen to them for incriminating evidence. I'm going to try and verbally paint this picture for you. But this man is probably 6'4", and he probably weighed 240 at the time. A great big, huge, strong man. And he's holding this little bitty tape recorder in his hand, and he's shaking. I mean, he's standing there shaking. The recording was of the torture and murder of one Shirley Ledford at the hands of Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker. It's something you never forget. It was really horrific. It just makes you want to uh, shudder to think that somebody could do that to anybody and, and cause that kind of pain. No Hollywood actress, uh, I don't care how good she is, could ever imitate what you heard on that tape. Uh, the, the screams were of this poor 16-year-old girl that had basically been turned into an animal. Four of the DAs that happened to be down from court at the time and heard it had to go home sick. Everybody who has, has heard that tape uh, has had problems uh, with it. I had nightmare cells that I uh, imagine hearing the, the screams of the uh, girls and I'd be running as fast as I could to try and uh, save them and I'd always get there uh, 10 or 15 seconds too late. It's just unbelievable that uh, uh, human beings could do this to uh, another human being. Shirley Ledford had literally spoken from beyond the grave and Stephen Kay had heard her cries for help. He was determined to avenge her death in a court of law. Five teenage girls kidnapped, subjected to unspeakable horrors, and then murdered. Roy Norris pleaded guilty to his part in the killings and agreed to testify against Lawrence Bittaker, his former friend and alleged mastermind of these vicious slayings. But would the jury believe the word of a convicted felon and a self-proclaimed serial killer? Deputy District Attorney Stephen Kay began his case against Lawrence Bittaker by calling Roy Norris to the stand. Norris methodically described the killing spree that ended with the murder of Lynette Ledford. Lynette Ledford's body was tossed in the uh, front yard uh, in a home out in the Sunland Tahunga area because Bittaker wanted to see what the reaction of the press was going to be. He was a little upset that uh, none of the other victims had been found and that there w wasn't any publicity about the, uh, the murder. So he, he wanted to read about himself in the, uh, in the paper. Would you state your name for the record, please? Sorry. In order to support Norris's testimony, the prosecution called to the stand the one person who had managed to escape from the killers. Shortly after the murder of Lynette Ledford, a sixth woman was attacked. She agreed to retell her ordeal to the court. And I was attacked by a man who tried to drag me into his bed. And that was so important because the jurors could see a real live victim who survived. Uh, they could hear the, uh, you know, the terror in her, uh, in her voice uh, when she was testifying. And th they could see how Norris and Bittaker operated with the van, with the sliding door open, with the engine running. Uh, and this, of course, uh, corroborated Norris to show the jury why they should believe him. But the strongest evidence against Bittaker were the tapes recovered from his van. The thing I remember most is that in the playing of the tape that there was a court artist. She got up and went crying out of the courtroom. Well, of course, a number of the jurors were, were uh, in tears. It was, it's just something that you, you could not listen to without it having an effect on you. 
the defense systematically attacked Roy Norris's credibility, claiming that he was the real killer. But when Bittaker took the stand, he testified that he was merely along for the ride and offered a bizarre explanation for the disturbing tape recordings. The way he explained this uh, tape was that it was, and I'm quoting him, it was pillow talk. Uh, and of course, when he said that, the, uh, the audience uh, broke out kind of in laughter and, dis and disbelief. Bittaker had not impressed the jury, but had Roy Norris both were unsavory, violent individuals with seemingly little regard for human life. Before the jury retired, Kay directly addressed them about the deficiencies in his witness's character. My closing argument to the, uh, the jury was, when a murder is committed in hell, you don't have angels for witnesses. I mean, maybe we did have angels, but they were all murdered. And I apologized to the jurors. I said, I, I really apologize to you that all I can ask for in this case is the death penalty. I wish I could ask for you to do to, to this man what he did to these girls. After three days of deliberation, they handed down their verdict. Lawrence Bittiger was found guilty of murder, kidnapping, rape, and torture. He was sentenced to death. I have handled a lot of brutal murder cases uh, during my career, but none of them can compare with the uh, Bittaker and Norris case. This is regarded as probably the worst of the worst. Roy Norris was sentenced